So we'll kick this off here in just a second. First of all, we got a little bit with PASS uh, community. Some, I got some news for you. Uh, first of all, there's no conference bridge for this. Uh, the audio is pure go to webinar. Uh, we will be on Twitter, so if you have any questions, first of all, ask them in the chat window here, but if you've got anything uh, fun or funny to say, uh, use the HADRVC hashtag on Twitter. Um, please ask, ask the questions in the question portion of the GoToMeeting uh, thing, and we are recording this, and we'll have this posted as soon as we can. Um, if you have any technical assistance, there's a, a few different options down there at the bottom with maximizing the screen, uh, and that's how you enter in the questions. Uh, we meet every month on the second Tuesday at 1 o'clock Eastern, noon Central. Uh, so upcoming speakers today is Tim Radney with Understanding SQL Server Backups and Restores. Uh, next month, we've got uh, Anthony uh, uh, Nocentineau. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce his name, sorry. <laughs> uh, May 10th and on performance monitoring of availability groups. And on June the 14th, we've got the SQL Server Tiger team talking about availability group troubleshooting improvements. All those are going to be great. Uh, make sure, fill out your MyPass profile, go in and update it by June 1st, uh, and that way you're eligible to vote in this year's PASS elections. This is really, really important. This is going to happen in September. Uh, please make sure to go do this by that deadline. So if you don't know, there are a lot of other really wonderful virtual chapters. Uh, you've got app development, data science, uh, uh, virtualization, performance, uh, professional development. We've even got one Saturday night SQL, which is a lot of fun. Uh, so check these out. Make sure uh, if you can't make them over the lunch hour or whenever they meet, uh, these are all recorded. So make sure to sign up for those. Upcoming SQL Saturdays. Uh, we've got some incredible SQL Saturdays coming up all over the place, all over the country and the world. A lot of really good stuff. So go to SQLSaturday.com to uh, check them out and find one near you. Uh, all of you are hopefully active members of PASS at this point. If you're not, please sign up for a free membership there at SQLPASS.org. It's a really, really wonderful organization, and I urge you to become a, an active member of it. Uh, and if you want to become an even greater active member, you can volunteer over at volunteer.sqlpass.org. So today, Tim Radney, our featured speaker of the day, uh, awesome gentleman. I've known the guy for a long time. Uh, SQL Server MVP presents all over the place and is now part of the SQL Skills family. And he raises chickens and tilapias for fun. So I'll turn this over to you, Tim. All right, thank you, David. Um, can you just confirm that you're seeing the intro slide okay? Yeah, it looks great. Fantastic. All right, so this is Understanding SQL Server Backups and Restores for the past HADR virtual chapter. Uh, thank you to David and John for having me back. And we'll go ahead and, and get started. So uh, David mentioned I'm with SQL Skills. Uh, this team includes Paul Randall, Kimberly Tripp, Gwen Berry, Aaron Stellato, Jonathan Cahayas, and myself. Uh, we do instructor-led training known as our immersion events. Uh, coming up, we're kicking off about five weeks or so in Chicago. We do online training with Pluralsight. Uh, our consulting practice, we do health checks, hardware, performance, and upgrades. We have a remote DBA services uh, where we uh, uh, keep tabs on your system, help your, your local DBAs, um, or be your DBAs if you don't have any speak at conferences all over the, the, the world. And the takeaway here is to become a SQL Skills Insider. Just go to sqlskills.com forward slash insider. Paul sends out a newsletter every couple of weeks. Uh, the, one of the, the cool things about that newsletter is it includes an insider video with a uh, pretty cool tips, tricks, how to, how to do things. So uh, good, good information to have. Uh, a slide about our immersion events. We have uh, everything from junior accidental DBA to two separate weeks for performance tuning, high availability, and disaster recovery. Uh, this is actually where I met uh, uh, David Klee at these events. Uh, business intelligence, SSIS, I mean, uh, data science. I mean, you name it, we have a, a week of training for it. And you can get more information at sqlskills.com forward slash training. A little about me, uh, I needed I should have gotten uh, David to update his bio because I now not only farm chickens and tilapia, I have uh, four goats and also have dabbled in aquaponics. And here soon I'll have a couple of cows. So I'm trying to go full out SQL farmer uh, to join several others in the community that, that um, have small farms. So it's, it's kind of neat. We can talk SQL, we can talk farms. 
of that for the next presentation you get. <laughs> Will do. Uh, so you can uh, reach me at Tim at SQLSkills.com, on Twitter at T. Radney, uh, a blog on SQL Skills, and I should blog on my own blog occasionally, you know, a little bit more often, but um, it, time runs out on having time to, to do enough writing. So I mentioned Pluralsight. If you'll email paul at sqlskills.com, uh, make them do a little bit of work, uh, put in the subject line user group Pluralsight code, and Paul will send you a code that you can use to register at Pluralsight. Uh, there's no catches, no credit card needed, just create an, an account, put that code in, and you get 30-day free trial of all the SQL Skills content on Pluralsight, which is over 120 hours of SQL Server training. And if, if the math is right, I believe we have already added four additional courses so far this year. So make sure to check that out. So on to what I'm going to cover today. So understanding SQL Server backups and restores. When you get started, you, you need to be able to plan your restore strategy. And in order to do that, you need to know your backup types. You know, um, and you need to know what the SLAs are. I mean, how much data can you afford to lose? How long can you be down? Don't ask the business that unless you expect to get no data loss, no downtime. You have to learn to negotiate and explain uh, what all this means to, to your, your lines of business. But you have to know which backups are correct for you and your organization in order to meet those SLAs. We're gonna talk about how to know that your backups are valid. And we're gonna talk about an approach for backing up very large databases. I actually have a pretty cool demo where I go through and show you how to do a piecemeal restore. We're gonna talk about how to restore your backups. And I have a lot of demos that we're gonna go through. You'll, you'll notice here in a few minutes, we have a few slides and then we drive, dive straight into demos where I walk you through how to recover from various types of scenarios. Performing a point in time restore, you know, that's critical. Most of us support OLTP workloads where data is constantly changing throughout the day. Our organization couldn't afford to lose all the data that was added or modified, deleted throughout the day. So we need to be able to restore up to a certain point in time. And by doing so, we're having transaction log backups. Again, I mentioned the piecemeal restore. I will demo that. And the one of the key takeaways here is having a solid restore strategy. You know, backup strategies alone are not enough. Most of us that have been in the field for a long time, we have a very horrid story that we can share with you about a, a client or someone that we know of or uh, a story that we've heard where an organization had a backup strategy and they were backing up to say tapes and then taking those tapes and storing them off site. And they would do a, a monthly full and then just either differentials or uh, log backups and a disaster would hit. They would need to restore that backup. So they would have to go and get the tape, load the tape, restore from tape, and then apply all those transaction logs. And seven days later, they were able to recover their database. Well, seven days of their clients not being able to work meant that company no longer existed. Now they had a, a, a backup plan, but it was an inefficient backup plan. So that's why Paul beats it into our heads. You don't plan a, or you don't um, plan a, a backup plan, you plan a recovery strategy. So have a restore strategy and know how long can you be down, how much data can you afford to lose. That will dictate your recovery models, the types of backups that you have, uh, potential HA solutions, DR solutions. So you get those facts and then, then you plan accordingly. And then lastly is having a proven disaster recovery plan. You know, a disaster recovery plan you know, is more than just being able to restore your data in another location or to another server. It's everything that encompasses that environment. Can the application server still talk to the database? What about all the files that you get, your ETL processes, you know, the whole holistic ecosystem of your application? Can you stand that up in another location? Where is that location? Does it exist? I love to ask the question uh, to a room of people is, you know, how do you recover your database? Well, I'll restore it to another server. You ask, well, what server? Where is it? If it includes going to a website to order the server, you have failed. You, you have to have these things in place, test them and know how long it takes and have everything documented. And what I like to do at the organization I was at you know, prior to joining SQL Skills is when we had to do DR test, I would hand them my run book and tell them, you know, here, execute it. 
they would say, no, you need to be on site to, to do this. I'm like, no, the, you should be able to follow my run book and recover my environment. Because if something happens to the data center and, and it's gonna take it out, it's probably gonna take me out too. So a true disaster recovery is you have somebody in another state, possibly another country, that's following instructions and in bringing this organization up. So here's my run book. Y'all have fun on Sunday. Let me know how it went on Monday. So it's it's literally to that type of level to to plan it, step through it, exercise it, and you know, either uh, feel confident in your recovery plan or have an up to date resume. I mean, your choice. So let's talk about backup types. Uh, there's a a lot to choose from. So what is the correct choice? Uh, we're all familiar with full or should be. You can do partials, differentials, file group, a file level, a log backup, and then copy only. If this is the first time that you're seeing copy only, you need to learn about this, um, this statement. If you're doing weekly fulls and daily differential backups, and you occasionally have to do a one-off full backup for some other reason, you should always back it up with copy only. Copy only does not reset the differential bitmaps. That is crucial because if you midweek took a full backup and you didn't choose copy only, then all your differentials after that full that you just took belong to the full that you, you made. So if you do the one-off backup, you restore it to another server, then you delete that backup. Well, now your fulls belong to a, a backup set that doesn't exist anymore that you can't recover from. And the time to find that out isn't during a crisis where you've restored your weekly full, you go to restore your most recent differential, it doesn't belong to your full, and now you're having to gather up all the transaction logs since your you know, full backup and applying those. That really kind of um, throws a wrench into your, uh, your re recovery strategy. So out of all these types of backups, you know, some combination of the above is usually warranted to meet the service level agreements of your organization. And in most cases, you're gonna do fulls with transaction log or a full differential and transaction log. If you have very large partition databases, then you're most likely also leveraging the file group level backups, which we'll discuss when we do the piecemeal restore. So just talked about it, very large databases. Very large is subjective, so um, use your judgment. I mean, some people think a 50 gig database is a large database, and I mean, okay, uh, in relative terms, maybe. But, you know, I'm talking about hundreds of gigabytes or more. I mean, approaching terabyte size, you know, status. Trying to manage and handle the you know, terabyte level to multi-terabyte level database backups becomes a, a cumbersome task because a, a weekly full of a, you know, terabyte database, I mean, that backup could take you several hours. You definitely wouldn't want to be doing full daily backups of a database that size. But what becomes more, you know, uh, more of an issue for me is recovering that database. You know, if we had a system-wide outage and we're having to restore, you know, hundreds and hundreds of terabytes worth of data, you know, the network, the disk subsystems, they're all gonna be saturated. So for me to restore a, a terabyte database, how long is that going to take? I mean, if I'm just restoring that alone and I have full bandwidth of everything, okay, maybe it only takes a few hours, but in certain situations, I mean, it could take you know, many hours and exceed my, my service level agreements. And do I really need all of that data online you know, to restore service to my customer? You know, what if I can partition that data into yearly file groups and the old archive data is in read-only file groups? Now I only have to focus on you know, the primary file group or a couple of read-write file groups for active data which could be from a terabyte size, I could be down to a couple hundred gigabytes. So I could bring those hundred, couple hundred gigabytes online in you know, minutes or, or you know, sub hours. And then you know, it, with some leisure, bring the older data online. So we'll discuss this, but in handling the very large databases, if you split the data into multiple file groups, you can use partition views, sliding window, um, using partitioning, you can manually move the data around. Um, I mean, there, there's a multitude of ways of, of partitioning the data, 
But the key takeaway is that this allows you for those partial restores, so you can restore the active partitions much more quickly. So we talked a lot about backup types, uh, partitioning, piecemeal restores, but you have to restore. What do you do? And when, when I have a, a physical audience in front of me and I ask the question, how many people in the room have uh, ever restored a database backup? If I had 100 people in the room, usually 100 hands would go up. Then I ask, how many of you have ever had to restore a full backup and then also apply transaction logs to it? I usually drop down to four to six hands still raised, which is kind of scary. If 100 people were responsible for restoring at some point, and these people are responsible for restoring production if something were to happen, but they've never restored a full backup and kept it in recovery and then applied transaction logs to it, the time to discover how to do that should not be in production when there's an outage and everybody is looking at you or waiting for you. So we need to practice these things. And it's very simple. And you'll see the demos for going through it. But if you're in a situation where you have to restore production, you need to perform a tail log backup if you can, if it's possible. What is a tail end of the log backup? Well, the tail end of a transaction log are any transactions that have occurred since the last transaction log backup. So if you're doing log backups every 15 minutes and you just took one five minutes ago, you have five minutes worth of transactions. So that is the tail end of your log. If you can get to the, uh, to the transaction log, I'm gonna show you some very brutal ways of um, corrupting a database and still being able to back up that tail end of the log. If you can get to the log file and you can get the tail end backed up, then you essentially have no data loss, which is incredible to be able to do. Think about if your organization lost your most mission critical database and you lost up to 15 minutes worth of data. What is that going to do to your organization? And it's one thing to have to apologize for having an outage. It's another thing to have to apologize to your customer base, all of them, stating between our of this and that, if you did business with us, we're sorry, we've lost all those transactions. Because you, know, you may not be able to tell what you lost. Um, that type of reputational loss you know, could be very problematic you know, for your company. And, you know, a minor glitch being down a few extra minutes, you know, not so much of a big deal. So let's say you, you were able to back up the tail end of the log, then you restore your last known good full backup. <clears throat> if you're doing differentials, then you apply the most recent differential, and then you restore your transaction log backups. And lastly, you'll restore the tail of the log backup if you were able to take it. So you have to have a plan. You know, we're gonna step through the types of ways that you can recover from your, full uh, from your, your backups. But you know, how, are you, how do you know that your backups are good? You need to test that you can restore them. In my life as a DBA, I have encountered backup routine jobs where they have commented out to not backup certain mission critical databases. The reasoning and the, the logistics for excluding a database from backup, I, 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 it was difficult for me to fathom why. And the answer that I was given was, well, we were doing some an, um, an upgrade to it, and we didn't want the additional I/O from the backup you know, running while we were doing um, this up, running this upgrade script. But then weeks had passed, and we weren't backing up this critical database. I've seen jobs where they set you know, backup to disk equals null, so we weren't actually backing up the databases, but the job was running successfully. So ways of catching that would be to uh, have a process in place to regularly restore and validate that your backups are good. There's lots of documented processes using you know, PowerShell, C Sharp code, uh, some really cool complex T SQL code. In the days of virtualization, it, it it's so simple to go and ask for a two to four vCPU server with you know, eight gig of RAM and some inexpensive tier three storage. You don't need you know, your your top end tier one storage for this. And then create a routine where you're regularly restoring your backups, either on a, a weekly or monthly basis. I would say at least every production database once a month. Set this as a routine. Should require very little of your, your time on a daily basis to go and uh, kick this thing off and build some reports. And auditors and examiners love this stuff. I mean, if you're a regulated industry and you can show that you're 
routinely, systematically testing your backups. They, they tend to leave you alone. They go and pick on somebody else. They think that you as the DBAs have your act together. You're, you're doing this stuff, you're on top of it and they, they feel comfortable. And then now you have a process in place that you can go and look and see how long your backups or your restores you know, actually take. Now given this would be on, usually would be on an inferior level machine. Production may be a, a physical 24 core, 128 gig of RAM tier one storage and you're, you're testing your, your restores on a uh, two or four, four vCPU machine with eight gig of RAM. So yeah, there'll be a, a difference, but it gives you something to start with. You know, if it takes three hours to restore, you know it should take less than that in, in production. But that gives you a, a starting point. So if you have to restore, um, you recover to another SQL Server instance that's not a, a mirror or log shift or availability group kind of thing where you have something in place to migrate over your users, how are you going to handle this? Are you going to have to restore the master database? You know, restoring master is not all that complex. I mean, you have to do it from you know, basically through SQL command, but your instance of SQL has to be at the same minor version of production. So if you're running uh, 2014 service pack one, so 12.0.4100 in production, you have to be at that same level on the server you're restoring master to. In the case of a big disaster, you may not have connectivity to the internet to go and download service packs or cumulative updates. So it could, could potentially prove to be problematic trying to keep a primary and secondary at the same minor version, especially if they're not part of an HA type solution. So a way to kind of circumvent this is to have your user object scripted out and the knowledge base article I've provided uh, gives you access or takes you to the SP underscore help underscore rev login stored procedure that you can use to script out your user objects. Um, you can create a job, save that to a, a file, store it in the same location as your backup files. So every single day you're dumping the, the users to, to a file and then you can you run the portions of that script that you need to create your users on your, your secondary server. But the, the key here, or one of the takeaways here is to know how long your restores take. Early in my career, we had a, a problem. We had to restore a, a mission critical you know, system. A C-level executive asked the, the guy that was in the cube behind me that was handling the restore how long it was gonna take. And he didn't, did not know that was very close to a career limiting move for that individual because the C-level executive could not comprehend how we who were responsible for the data could not give a, an idea of how long it was going to take to restore a database. Um, so it was after that moment that we built and defined our restore validation process. So you should go ahead and, and build one. So now we're going to dive straight into the fun stuff. So lots of demos. I like to start by restoring to a known state. And what I love about doing this is everybody's at a computer, there's no screen, so I really don't have to, to use Zoom it. So we're going to restore my database backup sample, so I'm at a, a known state. I'm gonna go ahead and clear my backup history. And if you're not familiar with the stored procedure, SB underscore delete underscore backup history, you should. Um, if you're if you rolled your own backup solution, then you're you're most likely not purging your backup and restore history. If you're using third-party you know, tools from uh, lovely vendors, or you're using Ola Halligren's uh, maintenance process, uh, he creates a job that cleans up the backup history. So as long as you scheduled it to run, it's being taken care of. But if you're if this isn't running, then MSDB is going to continue to grow because it's storing all of your backup and restore history. It's simple to to take this code here and change from get date plus one to say get date minus 30 or 60 or 90, however much uh, backup history you want to maintain. I'm wanting to purge everything, so I'm deleting everything older than tomorrow, which is everything in, in my MSDB. So if you have questions about that, feel free to shoot me an email. So what I wanna show you here is our max um, sales order ID is 75123. So I'm gonna start off by backing up my database. And then we're gonna do a, a log backup. We're gonna insert a, a transaction. So 75150, we're gonna do a transaction log backup. We're gonna insert another transaction, 75200, do a third log backup. 
and then insert a fourth transaction 75250 and take a final log backup. So four transaction log backups and um, you know, transactions that, that we've written to the database. So we'll take a look and see that we did in fact um, write 75150, 200, and 250. So disaster happens, we need to restore. We have four transaction logs and a full backup. What does our restore um, script, what should it look like? What order do we need to do these? Do we restore the full backup in our last transaction log, or do we have to restore the full backup in each of the transaction logs since the full in the order that they were taken? Now, having to write this code in the middle of the night or having to deal with you know, Management Studio and uh, going through the wizard and trying to pick and choose you know, can be cumbersome. I like to use scripts to automate things. So I have a, a handy little script here that will look at MSDB and based on the, um, the media set family and, and, and so forth, we'll bring back the restore script that we would need to execute to get our database. So here we see that we're restoring our full in each one of the transaction logs in order. We're choosing with no recovery after each restore. That way we can still apply additional backups. And then lastly, we restore database backup sample with recovery to bring that database online. So pretty cool. With this script or the, the one you'll see in the, the next demo, if you were to incorporate something like this in your backup routine, you're generating your restore scripts after each backup is, is made. So if something were to happen, and you couldn't get access to the transaction log to back up the tail end, then this is all you have. Your script's already written. You could just come here, select the syntax, paste it to another window. As long as your pathing was the same, you could recover that, that database on another server. So kind, kind of a neat concept to um, incorporate into your backup routine. So what if we're doing differentials? So let's restore back to a known state. We'll go ahead and clear our backup history again. This time we're going to um, uh, do another backup or another full, a log. We'll insert 75150. This time we're going to do a, uh, a log backup, 75200. We're going to perform a differential. Now the only change to the backup script to do a differential backup is you know, backup database you know, to disk, specify with differential. We're inserting a, another transaction, doing a log backup, another transaction, and finally, a log backup. So we have a full, a log, a differential, and a log log. So with this, what is our restore process? You know, which order do we restore our, our databases? Well, we have a script that we'll, we can run that will pull this. Now, technically, we could restore the full, in every transaction log that we've taken, just like we did before. But due to us having a differential in the middle of those transaction logs, we can restore the full, our differential, and then the log since the differential. Now, what, what I like to you know, use as an analogy of, of what is a differential backup is think of it as a cumulative log backup. Since differentials don't reset the differential bitmap, it's all data that has changed since the full backup. And essentially, like with transaction logs, it's data that's changed since the last log backup. Um, you know, restoring the differential allows you to skip those log backups between the differential and the full. So it's not, it's not a cumulative log, but it's a, a decent analogy to help you understand that um, it's all data that's changed since the, the last full. So in this case, we would restore our full, then our differential, and then log three and four. So that differential allowed us to skip log two and three, or excuse me, log one and two. And then finally you restore the database with recovery. All right, so we talked about piecemeal restore. So a very large database, being able to partition it, being able to bring on online portions of the database um, at a time. So for this one, we're gonna switch over to a database called uh, Backup File Group Sample. So we'll go ahead and restore it. 
And then I want to show you some characteristics of the backup file group sample. I'm going to refresh. We'll do a properties. And we'll see that, like most of your databases, you have a primary file group and or a primary file and a log and a single primary file group. The other thing I want to show you is our data set that we're working with. We have data from 2009 all the way through 2012. So at some point, I will update and replace you know, 2012 with 15 and, and so forth, so my, my data set's more relevant. Well, let's go ahead and uh, take a, a backup. And what we're going to do here is create additional file um, file groups. I'm going to create one for 2011, 10, and 9. And then we're going to create files and associate those files to their respective file group. So no partitioning is happening yet. We're just creating the infrastructure with the additional files and file groups. So we'll take a look at the properties again. Take a look at files and you see we created 2009, 10, and 11. Each one is one meg in initial size and auto grow by one meg. This is modeled after you know, model. Um, not really efficient, but for the purpose of the demo, it's going to work for us. And then we see that 2009 has a file, 2010 and 11. So the individual file groups and then the respective files associated. So I'm going to use a partition function. Uh, this isn't a partitioning session, um, but what I did is went through and just used a partition function, step through choosing my uh, left and right boundaries. And when I got to the end to click OK, I chose script to new window. And this is what it generated for me. So it's pretty easy to, to get that started. So let's partition our data. And now let's take a look back at our files. And we see that 2009 grew to 6 megabytes, 2010 to 2, and 2011 to 3. So data has been moved from the primary file group into the secondary file groups. So that's kind of cool. So in the event that I blow something up, I'm going to go ahead and take a full backup. But this backup here, we're going to specify individual file groups. We're going to back up in the primary file group, 2009, 10, and 11, into the same you know, file. I could have done individual backups uh, to respective files, but uh, this is just easier. So at this point, I want to show you that we still have the same 121,000 records all the 2009 through 2012 data. If we want to restore this and you know, we had a catastrophic failure or uh, you know, some massive corruption, something happened and you know, we're having to restore. And we just want to restore user functionality to our consumer by getting the primary, the most recent data online first. How do we do this? So it's the same syntax, restore database in your database name in this case, we're going to specify file group. So file group equals primary from disk in our location. And this is the only time that you'll use with partial. So you can only use a, a partial restore when you're restoring the primary file group. Then we're going to specify with recovery, and then we're going to replace the database that's there. So we'll kick this off. And we just processed you know, the 1,017 pages for the primary file group. If we take a look at sys database files and get the, the state description of our database, we'll see that the primary file group and the, and the log file are online, but our secondary files are in recovery pending. So interesting, can we query data that we know is in the primary file group? So data greater than 2012? Yes, we have 50,000 records. What about 2009? We know that 2009 is not online, if we try to query, we're going to get an error that one of the partitions for our index, DBO sales, gives us the partition, uh, partition ID that resides on file group 2009, cannot be accessed because it's offline restoring our defunct. This may limit the query results. So we look at results and we have nothing because we started with 2009. So let's restore 2009 file group. Take a look at the state, descri uh, state description and we see that 2009 is now online. So can we query it? If we choose where date between, we have 43,000 records. All of our 2009 data we can view. So what if we tried greater than 2009? Tried it before it failed. We're still going to get a failure as soon as we hit the file group 2010. But remember before it said would limit 
or query results. So we look at results and we have the same 43,000 records that we had before, although we, uh, even though we got an error. So from this point, we would have to specify between our dates for the uh, partitions that were online. So all of 2009 and 2012, if we query, we have the 94,000 records. So our 2009 data, and we'll scroll down and you'll see that we've presented 2012 as well. So it's really kind of cool that we can bring online different file groups at a time. With Enterprise Edition, this is uh, an online uh, transaction or an online operation. If you are with Standard Edition, this is an offline operation to restore the individual file groups. Uh, of course, I'm running with Developer Edition, so uh, same as Enterprise. So now we'll take a look and we'll see that the entire database is back online. We'll view all of our data and should have the 121,000 know, records. So that's a piecemeal restore. Nothing overly complex. Um, I mean, you, you have to know your syntax. There are some rules around restoring read-write file groups um, after transactions have occurred. You know, with those, you have to bring on your read-write and then apply your transaction logs to bring those online. <clears throat> In my experience working with it, I've been fortunate. The only read-write file group has been primary. Everything else in the secondaries have been read-only. Um, so, you know, your mileage will vary. That the, the important thing is if you're going to partition, you're going to test and work with um, you know, piecemeal type restores, practice it, practice it, practice it, and document it. Um, make sure it's documented well, because if you're the only person that knows how to do it and you're on vacation or holiday or uh, you know, just somewhere else, I mean, out to lunch and somebody has to do it, they should be able to follow a run book. It shouldn't just fall on your shoulders. All right, so tail log restore. I told you we would do some kind of cool stuff. This uh, used to be kind of the grand finale and then uh, now I've added encryption and Azure storage and showing you uh, using with stop at. But uh, this is the script that we created before and the, the, our first demo with the four log backups. So we're gonna restore it. We're gonna go ahead and show you the top sales order ID is the 75250. We're going to insert another transaction, just happens to be five nines. Um, for those who, who uh, understand the significance there, you know, we're trying to go for 99.99% uptime. So we'll go ahead and execute. So we added the five nines sales order ID uh, so our top two, 75250. We have not done any log backups or uh, any type of backup. We inserted the transaction, got a top two. So let's uh, alter our database and we're gonna set backup sample offline. So we'll refresh. We'll see backup sample databases offline. Let's go into our SQL data folder, backup sample. I'm gonna choose delete. And my MDF file is gone. People always ask, well, how often could this happen? I said, well, how often do you have to ask your storage admin for additional storage? Well, on a regular basis, you know, all of us have had to ask for it. And if your storage admin has ever said, uh, sure, but I have to format a new line first. And you're like, okay, sure, no, no problem. And then your, your phone lights up, you start getting emails, your storage admin calls and says, oops, I formatted the wrong line. Well, your, your MDF files are, are gone. So it could happen. I'm not gonna say it, that particular scenario has happened to me, um, but just saying, you know, it, it's, it's a reality. You know, corruption, you know, things can happen. So we've lost our data file. What happens if we try to bring the database back online? We get unable to open physical file, of course, because Tim just deleted it. Uh, cannot find the uh, spe file specified. It's reverting to the previous status. Well, let's take a look and see what happened to our database. We're now in a recovery pending state. This is kind of crucial. So we've seen recovery pending in the piecemeal restore. What happens if we try to take a log backup? You know, our standard log backup, which is backup log database name to disk, we're gonna get an error saying the backup sample cannot be opened due to inaccessible files, insufficient memory, or disk space. See the SQL Server error log. We, we talked about um, with copy only, how it doesn't issue a, um, it doesn't reset the differential bitmap or, or anything like that. With no truncate tells SQL Server continue on error. It's not gonna to try to issue a checkpoint when the log backup is taken. It's just you know, back up what you can. 
So if we issue the backup log, I'm choosing with a net in case my file already existed, you can omit that. So backup log database to disk equals whatever with no truncate and we execute, we just backed up three pages. So a database with no data file, only a log file, we were able to back up the tail end of the transaction. Can we restore it? Same script as above, but we're adding the tail log backup that we just made, processed everything. We take a look at the top two sales order ID, and we have 75250 and our five nines. Now that's great, but I mean, this is really, really cool. But what happens if this entire instance is gone? You know, the scenario that I gave, if my San admin formatted the LUN that has all my data files, it could also have my master MDF model, um, could be tempdb, I mean, my instance could be gone. So now I need to restore to another server. How would I do that? You know, could I attach the transaction log from one database to another? So we'll refresh databases, we see that there is no backup sample. Now, this is possible because, you know, I still have access to my LDF file. You know, the OS isn't, isn't gone, so I can get on the box, get my LDF files, and I'm writing my backups to a, a network device. So I'm not writing my backups to the same physical server or virtual server as, you know, the production database server. I'm, I'm following best practice. My database backups are somewhere else. So if that's the case, let's create a sample database called you know, backup sample, same database name. We're going to alter the database and set it offline, just like we did in the initial demo. So we'll go to our SQL data folder. I'm going to delete the backup sample database. I have my backup files from before and I, I copied over my log file. So now let's place or uh, overwrite the, the backup sample dummy database that we just created you know it's a a shell there's no tables there's no nothing so we're going to replace the log file and now let's try to alter the database and we get the same message before you know the data file does not exist we'll refresh and we see we're in a recovery pending state this is starting to look familiar isn't it so can we back up the log file yes so we just attached a transaction log from one database to another database just by creating a shell of a database and hacking it, attaching, so Kimberly Tripp calls it a hack attach. We just attached a transaction log from one database to another and backed up the tail end of the log. And due to us having our, our database backups on the network somewhere, we can access them so we can restore our full our four transaction logs previously, plus the tail log that we just took. And let's take a look, and we have our five nines transaction. So we just recovered a, the most corrupt database you can get, I mean, no data at all, yeah, that database with zero data loss. I, I, I like to joke and say that you could use this as you know, ransom, um, an extra week of holiday or vacation, a bonus, a promotion, a raise. I mean, this could be the difference in your company having massive reputational loss and just having to apologize for a, a minor inconvenience from you know, some downtime. So if you've never witnessed a, a hack attach or uh, backing up the tail end of, of a transaction log using with no truncate, congratulations, you've now seen it. Uh, you're now should be held accountable to be able to recover uh, data in the most extreme you know, type of scenarios. So let's switch back over to our primary. So we've shown the tail end of the log restore and a hack attach. With SQL Server 2014, uh, encryption was introduced into uh, the core product. So prior to this, you had to uh, purchase a third party utility or you had to back up to disk and then encrypt once you wrote the files to disk, which was still kind of a, a dangerous type scenario because you're dumping all the data to a a text file or a file that anyone with developer edition could go and grab your, your backup files and restore your data, which is kind of scary. You know, that we use expensive complex firewalls to kind of partition off and, and harden our SQL servers and we're limiting you know, access and creating you know, various groups and provisioning those groups access and you know, 
all these things to try to, try to protect the data, but then we back up to a network device that various systems engineers, domain admins, enterprise admins, uh, storage engineers have access to, so the data could still walk away. So how can we take that to a, a much more safe level? Is to encrypt our backups. So with 2014 and the introduction of um, you know, the backup encryption, how do we do it? Well, first you have to have a create a master key for your instance. But first, because I did this demo last night, I'm going to make sure that I delete my keys. So they are gone. We're just going to double check um, my location. Good, so they don't exist. So we're going to create a master key, and I'm going to uh, call it you know SQL skills or uh, create master key encryption. So and um, with a password SQL skills at. So we'll create that. And then I have to create a server certificate. So the certificate that I'm going to use to encrypt my backups with, I'm going to call it SQL Skills Encrypt Cert and just giving it a general um, description of SQL Skills Backup Encryption Certificate. So you can name it whatever you want. So if this is for a particular line of business for their databases, call it what you want. So we'll create our certificate. And before you can use the master key or your um, you know, server certificate, you have to back those up. And when you back those up, you have to encrypt those keys with a password. So I'm going to use a complex password. You can see it's very complex. I do not recommend using this in production. So we've now created our keys and we've backed them up to file. Now, what's crucial that you understand and keep up with is in order for you to be able to restore this encrypted database or encrypted backup file to another server, you have to restore this server certificate that you back it up or encrypt it with. So the SQL Skills Encrypt Cert that we've just backed up to C SQL Backup SQL Skills Encrypt Cert, I have to be able to restore that to another instance in order to restore this encrypted backup file. And in order to restore this, or this uh, certificate, I have to remember this encryption password. So not only is your database encrypted, your backup file of your certificate is encrypted. So I have to restore it or basically create certificate from file and decrypt it with the, this complex password. So you need your key and you need the password that you encrypted the key with. All right, so let's get started. So how do you back up a database with encryption? You choose with encryption and specify the algorithm. In this case, we're gonna use AES-256 and then you specify the certificate. And you can have multiple certificates on the server. So if you want to encrypt each database with a different encryption certificate, feel free to. This is going to complicate things, but you know, heck, if somebody compromised one uh, encryption certificate, they don't get all the data. And just to show, because I think it's kind of cool, we're going to use with compression for our encrypted backup. And we're going to do another backup with no compression. Um, yeah, no compression and no encryption so that we can see the effect of using compression with encryption to see if we get a decent compression ratio. So let's take a look and we'll see with our compressed encrypted backup, it's 4.52 megabytes and the non-compressed is 15 megabytes. So we're getting a pretty good amount of compression even with using uh, encryption. So kind of cool. And then you see here that we backed up our certificates and certificate key. So we, we now have an encrypted backup. How do you restore your encrypted backups? Since this server already has the encryption key on it, we do nothing except restore database from disk, and we're going to replace what we have. We execute, we just restored an encrypted you know, backup file. But what if we don't have the certificate? So we'll drop our certificate SQL skills encrypt, and now we'll restore try to restore the same database and we get cannot find the server certificate with thumbprint and it gives us the unique um, thumbprint value for the SQL skills encrypt cert. So let's run the same syntax that we used before to create that SQL skills encrypt cert. So now we have a certificate. We attempt the same restore and it fails because it does not have that unique thumbprint of the first um, encryption certificate that we created. You know, its thumbprint is different. So let's drop our certificate. 
And like I said before, we have to create certificate from file and we specify the location and we have to decrypt by password. So if we forgot our password, we have a database backup that we can't restore. If we don't have our key backed up that we can access and restore, we don't have a database that we can restore from. So we've um, restored our certificate from file, and now we can successfully restore this database. So again, we talked about, you know, if you're trying to restore this to another instance. So let's jump back over to our secondary server. We'll make sure that none of the keys exist. They do not. So we'll create just a, a random master uh, key. I'm going to call it new SQL skills. Remember before it was like SQL skills at. Because I store my uh, backup or my encryption keys, you can store these in a key vault. There's tons of different you know, uh, software applications and things, even an Azure key vault that you can store encryption keys in. But uh, I happen to have this backed up key local. We'll restore it by creating the certificate from file. And then that uh, encrypted backup that we took, we restore the database. And now we have our encrypted backup restored to another instance called backup file group sample. So not overly complicated. Uh, you just have to understand you know, the master key and server certificate you know, situation and then make sure that you have some really good key management uh, you know, in place before you start backing up and encrypting your backups because you're protecting them from you know, hackers and unauthorized users, but you're also protecting them from you. And if you can't decrypt it, then you don't have backups that you can, can properly use. So that's a, that's a big deal. So we'll switch back over to our you know, primary. With SQL Server 2012, I believe it was like Service Pack 1 or Service Pack 2, a cumulative update, 6 or something like that. Um, that's a trivia question or, or SQL Jeopardy question. When did SQL Server start supporting Azure or URL-based backups? You know, is 2012 something, um, you know, one of those updates. It introduced URL-based backups. And I always like to kind of joke and say, you know, back when Henry Ford was around and talking about the Model T, you can order the Model T in any color that you want, so long as it's black. Um, in this case, you can back up to any URL that you want, as long as it's Azure storage. So I've created a um, uh, an Azure account. I'm going to drop this down because I've, I've run this a few more times since, since then. We're going to back up to URL. So just like instead of disk to URL, we specify the our, our blob storage account and the file name that we want it to go to. Uh, I have to use a credential. So under security, you have credentials and I have Azure backup. With this, you'll get your, your password and information from your Azure or your, your, um, your uh, portal account. Uh, that information is there under your, your storage. So you'll paste that over and create your uh, Azure credential. This is what allows you to talk to your, your blob storage. So let's go ahead and kick off a, a backup to Azure. So this is now, instead of backing up local, it's creating the file, it's connecting over to my Azure storage account, validating that this file doesn't already exist. And then uh, within the next few seconds, we should see it right out. Uh, usually this takes less than 25 to 30 seconds to, to execute. So 22 seconds. The restore is just the same. We have to specify the credential in order to connect to the storage. And instead of two, it's from URL. And we're gonna replace and still specify stats. And usually the restore takes a few seconds longer than, than the backup itself. Now, why this is kind of cool is small businesses that need offsite backups you know, that can't afford to, to spend the thousands of dollars a month on an additional you know, server and SQL Server license, or um, don't want to rely on you know, you know, Dropbox and things like that to have the, the backups, they can back up directly to Azure Storage. And then if they wanted to have an Azure VM sitting there running SQL Server for a few dollars a month that can connect to the storage to do the restores, they can have offsite DR for uh, you know, literally you know, pocket change a month. So it's a very, very cool uh, technology and an easy way to set up a, a hybrid cloud type DR solution um, on the cheap. 
So we talked about the stop at. Uh, these scripts are available. Um, you'll see in, in a, a moment, I, I'll provide you a URL. But we're going to um, restore, if this demo works correctly, I've, I've run through it a couple of times. So this is pre-point in time. So we're going to um, take a look at, so we have you know, no data in there. So let's, um, we're going to restore our, our backup with a no recovery. And then we're going to restore a transaction log that I took that should have uh, like 10 or so uh, transactions, you know, written to it. So we restore, we take a look at, you know, the, the point in time table. And we see that we have uh, like every you know, 30 seconds I was writing a transaction. So you see the date time. What if some disaster happened and we need to stop at uh, 209 and 26 you know, milliseconds? So we can take this and within this single transaction log file, so we restored backup sample pit, you know, point in time. And it has all 10 transactions, but this transaction uh, or, or everything that occurred after this time, there was a disaster. It was much wrong data. So we want to stop you know, at that point. Then within this transaction log, you can choose with stop at and specify the point in time or the transaction ID, uh, things like that. So let's take a look. We'll restore and stop at 209 and 26 milliseconds. And we'll take a look at the point in time table. And there we stopped. So within a transaction log, so not only can you have transaction log backups and kind of up to that point in time from your log, you can also specify when to stop within the transaction log itself. So that's, that's kind of cool. You know, you don't have to just lose everything in that transaction log if you you know, had something that occurred and you can kind of step through the log. There's log readers where you can uh, you know, get more granular, um, but just for you to know that this technology exists and that you can do piecemeal restores, you can do hack attaches, you can do tell log backups with no truncate. You can specify the time to stop restoring within a transaction log file. This is some cool stuff. You don't have to just rely on your last you know, transaction log backup or um, know that if you had a problem within that log, you have to go back to the one before. You can get very granular in a lot of situations and prevent you know, this data loss. So that's all the demos. So I'll get back over to our slide. And you know, in summary, you, you need to know those backup types and have the proper backups to meet your customer service level agreements. You need to know how to recover. So having a restore strategy and knowing how long your restores take, um, knowing how to perform those point in time restores that we just did. You know, having a plan, you know, restoring for the first time in production, you know, to understand how these restores operate is not conducive. I mean, it's not good for your career. You need to practice this stuff. Having a solid backup strategy that meets the requirements. So plan that recovery strategy and that will dictate what your backup strategy should be. And then having that proven disaster recovery plan in place. If, if your company can't successfully fell over to a, a DR site, if that disaster happens, you know, the, the next Hurricane Katrina or whatever it may be, you, you may be out looking for a job. So in that, your disaster recovery plan may be that you keep your resume up to date because if something happens to your organization and then the company shuts its doors, you're in your competition or your coworkers. So if you're three days ahead of them getting your resume into recruiters' hands, you know, that's, that's better for you. And so all the scripts that I... Uh, just presented, I'm going to upload to timradney.com forward slash presentations so that you'll have my sample databases and you'll have um, a slide deck could be in the, the zip file. I've also provided uh, John and, and David uh, with a PDF, um, but you'll have the code that I executed. And if you have any questions about any of it, you know, feel free to hit me up on Twitter at tradney or email me at tim at sequelskills.com. So with that, I want to say thank you. And hey, Tim. 
We yes. had a, a couple of questions, um, one that just came in and one that I apologize, I had to step away for a second in case it was already asked, but I just wanted to, to make sure it, it was asked if it wasn't. Um, and they both kind of relate to each other, but the first one is, if you do a backup with checksum, is there any extra overhead compared to doing the, the backup without checksum? I think the checksum happens after the backup file is, is created. You know, I'm, I've never been asked that, and I've never really dug into the mechanisms of, you know, when the checksum is occurring. But my understanding is the checksum validates that the, the backup file is consistent in a valid backup file. Um, so I think that would be after the, the, the data has been written to disk, but I would have to 100% to, – to answer 100%, I would have to um, look that up or test it. Okay. But, I mean, at a minimum, I mean, any overhead would be – be minor compared to the benefit that you're getting. Agreed. Uh, someone asked if you could just go back to the last slide for a second also. Thank you, sir. Let's see. A couple other that just popped in here as well. Yes, the presentation will be made available over on the HADR virtual chapter website. And can we call differential backup as an incremental backup? No. Uh, incremental is all data that has changed since the last incremental, um, and a differential is all data that has changed since the last full. So, kind of, sort of, you know, I mean, if it helps you understand it, but, you know, they are completely, there, there, there's some very keen differences that uh, differentials continue to grow over time. So, it's all data that has changed since the full. So, say Sunday you have a full backup, Monday you have a gig worth of data change. Tuesday is a gig worth of data change. Your differential on that Tuesday would be, you know, for easy math, two gigabytes. Uh, whereas incrementals, you know, are, uh, you know, the way I believe or remember incrementals working, it's um, all day that, that's changed since that incremental. Um, and just, so th there are some differences. Yep. And then I apologize if David already uh, went through this one with you, but someone asked, does a backup process on a live production database slow down the server? So there's really no blocking that occurs when you're doing the backup, but there is I.O. So technically, yeah, there's some overhead, but I mean, nothing of I mean, the overhead you're going to have is, is you know, I.O. Um, so if you have adequate I.O. subsystem, it, you shouldn't really see any any problems whatsoever. Yep, the way I responded to that uh, with the little chat thing here was, uh, you know, if the I.O. subsystem and the networking can handle it in their environment, you shouldn't notice anything. Uh, if it's got any sort of bottlenecks or any sort of sluggishness to it, uh, you may notice some disk latencies that creep up. Awesome, cool. Well, thank you, Tim. Uh, Appreciate your session as always, as it's one of the grassroots reasons why we formed this chapter so that people can get good education on knowing how to keep their jobs instead of focusing on making the resumes highly available. <laughs> that's right. SP <laughs> underscore update resume. I, I don't think that Sprock's been updated in a while. <laughs> That'd be a good joke, uh, joke <laughs> blog post for you. So, all right. Thanks, everyone, for coming out, Tim. Thank you once again for presenting for mm -hmm. us, and we'll catch everyone next month. Cool. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you all.